Yesterday, about uh, 7.30 in the morning, I was walking at Del Oro Park alongside a neighbor I had just met for the first time, watching my dog lead his dog in crazy madcap circles around and around and around the park in the rain and the wind. And he said to me, I guess this is how we know we really love our dogs. <laughs> but I'm not complaining. And of course, I wasn't complaining either. Not just because it was so delightful to watch the dogs playing. To see their uh, exuberance in the midst of the wild, wet weather, but because the weather was wet. What a difference it makes when you live in a semi-desert, as we do here in California, when it rains in the winter, like it's supposed to. In the prophecy of Isaiah that we hear this morning, another of these beautiful passages we've been hearing for the last several weeks about God's restoration of the people, the bringing the exiles back and restoring Jerusalem and Judah to their former glory and indeed to an even greater glory this week, uh, after hearing uh, a couple of weeks ago about the temple and the city of Jerusalem being raised higher than all the other mountains and all the nations of the world streaming in to receive instruction from God, to learn the laws of God and the ways of God, and then the word of God going out from Jerusalem throughout the world so that all the nations turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and study the ways of war no more. After hearing last week about the root of Jesse sprouting the righteous branch of the new king, the one on whom the spirit of God rests, a spirit of wisdom and of counsel and of understanding, who will judge the poor with equity and administer justice to the oppressed. We hear how the relationships of predator and prey will be ended forever, and the wolf will live with the lamb and the leopard lie down with the kid. Well, this week we hear also again a, a message of universal salvation that will flow forth from the salvation and redemption of Israel. And the focus this week is not on the temple or the city of Jerusalem, not on the king the successor of David, but on God's people, upon those whose eyes are blind, but now can see, those who have been deaf, but whose ears are unstopped, those who have been able, unable to walk, who are now leaping for joy, those whose hearts were filled with fear, who take courage and are filled with gladness. And along with the salvation of God's people, the desert itself will rejoice and bloom. It will be like those most delightful garden places of the land of Israel, the plain of Sharon and Mount Carmel, it will be a place where the dry sands, the burning sands of the desert become pools of water, 
The dry grasses of the desert become reeds and rushes. The land itself will rejoice with the people as they walk on that royal highway, that highway of holiness that brings them at last to their true home. And when Jesus is asked by the disciples of John the Baptist, whether he himself is the one who is coming. He doesn't actually answer the question, typical Jesus behavior. Matthew supplies the answer uh, in the narration, says, you know, uh, when John asked his disciples to go and find out what the Christ, the Messiah, was doing. So we know the answer has been given away by the, the gospel narrator. But Jesus himself doesn't answer that question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we wait for another? But he says, open your eyes. Unstop your ears. And tell John what it is you see and what it is you hear. And the things that they are to see and to hear are the works that Jesus has been performing in his ministry in Galilee, works on behalf of the people. Not great mighty deeds of vengeance and of judgment, of punishment, but works of healing, of restoration, of encouragement and empowerment of the poor and the afflicted. Even as in the story of the little daughter of the leader of the synagogue, raising the dead to new life. These are the signs of what God is doing in Christ. These are the signs of the seed that has been planted on the earth in the words of Jesus, and in particular in his death and resurrection. Because this is a Messiah to whom some object. This is a Messiah to whom, for whom it is always possible to disagree, who can be a stumbling block to our faith, a scandal to our expectations, a frustration to those of us who want shortcuts to justice and redemption and healing, a Messiah who works among the least, who heals the forgotten, who opens the eyes of the blind and unstops the ears of the deaf, so that people, ordinary people, recover the capacity to know God and to do God's will in spite of everything that works against them. The letter of James speaks of this harvest for which we all hope, this harvest of justice and of peace, of unity and equality and harmony among God's people, this harvest of ecological restoration and renewal where the land itself will rejoice with God's redeemed. But it speaks of it as a seed that has been planted, which God will water in due season with the early rains 
as we have been experiencing them this weekend, as they predictably came to the land of Israel after the uh, crop of winter wheat and barley had been planted in the months of October and November, but would, which would not come to its fullness without the late rains that came in March and April, as they do here after our January dry spell in a normal year. The late rains that only God can give. And so we must be patient. We must be patient with the fact that this kingdom in which even the least is greater than John the Baptist. This kingdom we await will take its time. It will be known in simple and perhaps insignificant acts of compassion and healing and making justice and doing peace. It will be a kingdom that takes its time because it comes in God's time, with God's grace. There is no shortcut to it. And there will always be those who stumble over this fact, this kingdom of a crucified Messiah, this kingdom that grows up from the earth, from the bottom, that grows from out of the least and of the lost. And yet, says James, don't lose patience. In your frustration, don't start blaming each other and grumbling about it, uh, finding fault with one another for the fact that this uh, peace and joy sometimes seems so elusive, but have trust. Have trust and open your eyes to see how God is working in your neighbor, in your town, in unexpected places. Be grateful for the simple blessings of rain in due season and the grass that begins to sprout. Be hopeful in spite of all the indications that uh, hope is perilously hanging by a thread. Keep watching. Unstop your ears and listen. Christ is coming. 